The following program is brought to you by Caltech. Now, as the chair of this year's committee, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce this year's general session speaker, Dr. Lee Hood. Dr. Hood received his bachelor's degree in biology from Caltech in 1960 and his PhD in biochemistry here in 1968. While a faculty member in our division of biology, he and his research colleagues developed four instruments that laid the technological foundation for molecular biology. The DNA gene sequencer, the DNA synthesizer, the protein sequencer, and the protein synthesizer. In 1992, Dr. Hood moved to the University of Washington where he founded and chaired its Department of Molecular Biotechnology. And in 2000, he co-founded the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle. He has received numerous honors and awards, including a Caltech Distinguished Alumni Award of his own in 2011, election to the Inventors Hall of Fame, and the National Medal of Science. He has also been involved in the founding of more than a dozen biotechnology companies, including Amgen and Applied Biosystems. Dr. Hood is also co-founder and chairman of the P4 Medicine Institute, where P4 stands for predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee Hood to the stage for his talk entitled Systems Medicine and Proactive P4 Medicine, Revolutionizing Healthcare. Dr. Hood. Well, thank you very much. It uh, is a pleasure to return to Caltech. Uh, I spent 30 years of my career here at Caltech as an undergrad, a grad, and then uh, as a faculty member, and it certainly is where I grew up scientifically. What I'd like to talk about today is the revolution that we're seeing in medicine that already is beginning to profoundly uh, transform medicine, and I'll give you uh, the take-home lesson to get started. One is that this new discipline in biology called systems biology has really transformed medicine in incredible ways. And one of the ways is it's let, it, let us look at the complexity of disease uh, of a discipline called systems medicine. And I'm going to argue that already it's improving healthcare it's beginning to decrease the costs of healthcare, and it's promoting innovation, and I'll try and uh, persuade you of that as we go on. What I thought would be useful would be to give you a uh, personal view of how this came about so, you wouldn't, uh, so I wouldn't trivialize uh, what I think are really profound ways of thinking about medicine these days. And interestingly enough, it uh, really all began back at Caltech. I came here in 1970 as a molecular immunologist, and what I very quickly became impressed with was the enormous complexity of immunology. And I wasn't convinced at all this one gene and one protein at a time study approach was ever going to deconvolute that uh, complexity. And indeed, in thinking about the complexity, it was obvious that at least in part this complexity arose from the operation of Darwinian evolution, that random and chaotic process, which is indifferent to efficiency, but what it does is builds upon past successes to solve biological problems. And indeed, in many ways, what ends up happening is you generate a complexity that's very much uh, akin to this Rube Goldberg machine. And I think the analogy of a Rube Goldberg machine is really an interesting one. So here's a device that has 14 different gadgets that are linked together that allows Rube Goldberg to cool this soup. And if you ask yourself the question, how could we figure out how this machine works, the correct answer to that question is what systems biology is all about. So number one, you'd have to define all the parts in the uh, machine. And number two, you'd have to figure out what they did individually. Number three, you'd link the parts together in their system. And number four, you'd study the dynamics of the system so that in time you could come to understand uh, just how the soup gets cooled. And that's really what systems biology is all about. It's about 
defining the parts, understanding their dynamics, and coming to understand how that actually can contribute to function. Early in my career at Caltech, I read a book uh, called The Nature of Scientific Revolution by Thomas Kuhn that really made a profound impact on me. It was a book about paradigm changes in physics, and Kuhn talked about what a paradigm change is. That is, it's a transformation in how we think about a particular biologic problem. And he pointed out that paradigm changes are incredibly difficult to achieve, in part because of the enormous conservative nature of many scientists. In fact, he pointed out that often paradigm changes come about when the young accept the change and the old just fade away. Uh, that certainly has been, uh, in part, my experience. With regard to medicine, I've had the good fortune over uh, 45 years or so of my career uh, to participate in five paradigm changes. And I'll list them briefly for you because each of these paradigm changes really was central to my final thinking about systems medicine and the thing we'll define later, uh, P4 medicine. The first you've already heard about, it was uh, bringing engineering to biology, uh, developing instrumentation that let us generate lots of data in an automated fashion. And I will say, the biologists at Caltech were extremely uncomfortable having an engineer in their midst. And some suggested I be moved from biology uh, to engineering. And I'll say later when I did leave Caltech, in part, it was this lack of daringness on the part of biology that really did influence me. Number two, one of the instruments that we developed was the automated sequencer. And that got me invited to the first meeting ever on the Human Genome Project by Bob Sinsheimer, a former Caltech biology professor in the spring of 1985. He invited 12 people to assess whether the Genome Project was a good idea. And we came to two interesting conclusions. One, it was possible, but technically extremely difficult. Uh, and two, we were split six to six on whether it was a good idea. And indeed, the six against it were uh, phenomenally against it. And it was argued that big science in biology is bad science, that the genome had mostly junk. Who would want to sequence junk? You'd never get anyone uh, very good to participate in this process. And of course, uh, all of those arguments really turned out to be wrong. Uh, it was interesting that the National Institutes of Health was one of the most opposed uh, to the Human Genome Project. And in fact, it was the Department of Energy that really carried it in the early years and played a seminal role in bringing it about. The development of the automated sequencer made me realize that you had to, in biology, bring together engineering, chemistry, computer science, and, and advanced biology to really achieve this uh, instrument, this, uh, this advance. And I realized that Cross-disciplinary biology had to be the future of biology because we needed that kind of environment to develop the machines and tools that we needed for the future. And uh, it became obvious, that, again, that the division of biology was not keen about having a department of cross-disciplinary biology that would compete with them. But Bill Gates made it possible to move to the University of Washington in 92. And, set up that department. And that department really had uh, a spectacular string of successes. It started the field of proteomics. It developed the key software for the Human Genome Project. We developed uh, a fifth instrument there, the inkjet technology for synthesis of DNA and the creation of DNA, array, DNA arrays that's been commercialized by Agilent, and, and on and on. But the dean who hired me, who guaranteed me after four years uh, a, an additional floor in a building to build a systems biology group on top of the cross-disciplinary group, unfortunately died in a uh, climbing accident in the Himalayas. And the next dean had a very different set of priorities. And it was for that reason that in uh, 2000, I resigned from the university to create the first Institute of Systems Biology, and we'll say a word or two about that in just a moment. 
And it was a, a small step from creating that institute to begin focusing these systems approaches to disease that led to systems medicine and event, eventually to uh, P4 medicine. So let me talk a little bit more about the, the last two paradigm changes. Uh, first of all, beginning with the Institute for Systems Biology. Today we have about 230 staff. We have 10 faculty members. The essence of the environment is it's open, it's proximal, it's cross-disciplinary, uh, and it's interactive. Our essence has been to kind of envelop, develop for biology system science, but we've pushed in two applied directions. One, healthcare, and that's what I'm going to talk about in most of this lecture. And two more recently, uh, learning how to re-engineer microbes to carry out the chemistries of life. And this is, I think, an enormously exciting opportunity for the future. We are uh, committed to transferring knowledge to uh, society, and I'll talk a little bit about how successful we've been in, in creating companies. I might point out, together with Stephen, in 1980, I remember going to Murph Goldberger saying, look, I wanted to start a company. And he gave me this long lecture about the role of an academic institution is education and scholarship. And I said, but it's also to transfer knowledge to society. He said, well, if you want to do it, you're on your own. And th so that was the start. And we, uh, I went to 19 companies trying to persuade them that these instruments we developed were going to be the future of biology and was 0 for 19 until a venture capitalist called up. And we did start Applied Biosystems, which uh, became a leader in that particular area. More recently, I've really focused on national and international strategic partnerships, convinced that federal funding for big science and biology is going to be really tough in the future, and that if you want to pursue big biology, you're going to have to go elsewhere, and strategic partnerships are a great place. For example, one thing we did as an institute, I think we could never have done at a university, is created an agreement with the state of Luxembourg that brought over a five-year period $100 million to ISB to develop the tools and strategies and uh, analytic wherewithal to carry out P4 medicine or systems medicine. The second thing I'll indicate is uh, give you a sense of a metric of quality for the institute. And this is a Spanish institute that developed a metric for measuring and integrating across entire research institutes the impact of their papers. They surveyed about 3,300 institutes in 2012, and ISB came out fourth in the world in the excellence of its papers. Uh, and we had papers in biology, in medicine, in technology, in computation, and, and uh, mathematics as well. So uh, the essence of, I think, what systems biology is all about is creating this cross-disciplinary platform and culture, which has been such a powerful engine for us. And the mantra that we started ISB with is a simple idea that leading-edge biology mandates the need to develop new technologies, and they, in turn, in their data, require the development of new analytic tools. And if you can do those three things in a seamless manner, you really can revolutionize biology. And what's interesting about this mantra is that each turn of the cycle, you create new technologies, new algorithms, or new concepts. And ISB has actually used this type of thinking to create 17 new companies in the Seattle area in the 13 years of our existence. And some of them, as you'll hear later, uh, are going to do uh, very well. Now, the question is, how do you generate an environment that enables this vision. And that, of course, requires a cross-disciplinary environment with all of the scientists you see listed there on the right-hand side. And those scientists have to do two things. One, they have to learn to speak the languages of one another. And two, they have to learn to work effectively together in teams. And with this, you really can change the world very effectively. 
So from that, let me move on and give you another view of what systems biology is about. In, in this case, we'll use uh, an analogy of figuring out how a radio works. So if you were an engineer and wanted to figure out how uh, a radio converted radio waves into sound waves, you'd take the radio, you'd uh, identify the component parts. Once again, you'd learn how the individual component parts worked. And this is what biology really has done for the last 40 years, is to find the individual components and how they work. But what you as an engineer would know is you aren't even a micro step to understanding how those parts make the conversion of, of uh, electromagnetic net waves to, um, to sound waves. And to do that, of course, you have to assemble the parts into their circuits and then come to understand individually and collectively how the circuits make this kind of conversion. And this is exactly what living organisms are all about. They have biological circuits or biological networks that deal with information in sophisticated and complex ways. And in this regard, let me uh, uh, talk about a systems approach to medicine. And what we have to first talk about in thinking about this systems approach are the natures of biological information. So the core of what you are is embedded in your genome. That's DNA, four-letter language, and it uh, encodes uh, your uh, basic potential. The, that is, there are six billion letters of this language. They're present in 23 pairs of chromosomes. But the chromosomes are quantized into individual units called genes, segments of the nucleotides that actually can be differentially converted into a second type of nucleic acid called RNA. That again has a four-letter language. And this differential conversion allows you to amplify in different types of cells appropriate kinds of information. The RNA then is fed into a special machine that converts it into protein. And here we go from four letters into a 20-letter language. And because of the diversity of those languages, proteins can fold into an incredible array of three-dimensional structures. And the proteins are the molecular machines of life. What's fundamental about proteins is they almost never operate in isolation. They operate together to create molecular machines, complex molecular machines, or they operate in networks to create these biological systems. So the essence of information we have to understand in medicine is this information hierarchy you see there. But another question that you have to ask is, what are the fundamental types of biological information? And there are really two fundamental types. One is your genome, the digital information that encodes uh, the information of life. And of course, it contributes to the information hierarchy we talked about. But the second independent kind of information is that which comes from outside the genome, the so-called environmental information. And the two of these types of information go together uh, to create the phenotype of the organism, that is, the appearance of the organism, to create the normal phenotype or to create the diseased phenotype. And what connects these two types of information with your phenotype are these biological networks that we talked about before. And I'm going to say a word more about those in just a minute. Now, with this really brief in introduction to thinking about medicine as an informational science, let me say, as I look out into the future, the only way we can deal with the enormous biological complexity in each one of us is to create for each individual an enormous amount of information. And I see in a 10-year period having each uh, individual patient be surrounded by a virtual cloud of billions of data points of many different types of data, molecular and cellular, classic medical data that we know about, uh, and, and of course, even up to including the social network data. Now, this enormous data cloud, we will have the tools in 10 years 
to reduce that data dimensionality to simple hypotheses about how to optimize wellness and how to minimize disease for each individual. Let me just say with these, uh, this multi-scale dimensionality of data that we'll have for each individual, there are two enormous challenges. One, how can we integrate this data together so we can create predictive and actionable models? And I'll say a little bit more about that in just a second. But two is in every large data set, there is an enormous amount of noise. How do we extract the signal from all of that noise? And that's the essence of the tools that systems biology provides for us. So one way to create to take this information and convert it into what is the beginning of a model is something I call the network of networks. So you actually have networks that operate at the genetic level. That, uh, you have networks that operate at the molecular level. You have networks that operate at the level of cells, at the level of organs communicating with one another, and find, finally the social networks of populations. All of these go together to give an integrated network of networks. When you have a disease, uh, the disease perturbation comes either genetically and or environmentally, and it alters the envelope of information that that network of networks produces. And what systems biology is about is capturing that altered envelope of information for one it gives us fundamental insights into disease mechanisms. Two, it gives us deep insights in how to do diagnostics very more, more effectively. And three, it begins to give us clues into new approaches to therapy. And I'll begin to give you uh, an idea of what this uh, finally is all about. So systems medicine is now transforming healthcare in really profound ways. And what I'm going to do is give you a list of the major ways it's transforming medicine, and then I'm going to give you three examples of where we're beginning to see things that are altering uh, how we practice healthcare. So the first idea is that we can, in living organisms, study the dynamics of these disease-perturbed networks, and by capturing the nature of the differentially expressed information disease get deep insights into mechanisms and new approaches to diagnosis and therapy. And I'll show you some examples of that. Number two, about four years ago, we decided we would integrate genetics with genomics by actually determining the complete genome sequence of families. And basically what this has opened up is a powerful new way of identifying disease genes, and we're actually beginning to identify wellness genes as we speak now. So number uh, three, we have changed blood into a window that can distinguish health from disease, and I'm gonna give you two nice examples of where we've got diagnostics that are really gonna make uh, a big difference. All diseases, aren't a single disease, but almost always there are subtypes of the disease. Breast cancer is probably at least five different types of disease. Until you have the ability to stratify disease into its different subtypes so you can do a proper impedance match against therapies, you're not gonna get very far. And this is why Alzheimer's has turned out to be a terribly difficult problem. It probably is at least uh, 10 different diseases. But again, with systems approaches, we're beginning to have the tools to uh, deconvolute and stratify those diseases. What is equally interesting is we have to stratify all of you as individual patients. What classic medicine does is it takes a large population like this, it abstracts your features, and it puts them in bell-shaped curves, and if you're on the extremes, you're said to be sick. And that's utterly wrong because you can be on the extremes, and depending on your genetic constitution, you may be sick or you may not be sick. So in P4 medicine, what we do is we view each individual as a quantized unit, and we stratify them according to their genetics in the context of the environment in which we'd like to stratify. So for example, there are probably 70 genes out there that 
lead to an inability to deal effectively with drugs, you certainly want to know about those genes so you won't have the drug uh, be underutilized or be uh, too rapidly uh, utilized. We have new approaches to drug target discovery. We can think about, for example, disease perturbed networks and asking if we had drugs that could target certain nodes in those networks, could we convert them to a more normal behavior? This is a revolutionary new way in identifying drug targets. And, and I'll say what drug companies are terrific at is making drugs. What they're abysmal at is choosing the targets for drugs. So these systems approaches, I think, can really uh, change the cost of drugs in the future. And we're going to talk a little bit about assays for wellness, because that's going to be very, very important in the future. So let me talk about, then, three of these revolutions. And the first is family genome sequencing. And to give you an example of how powerful this is, the first family whose genomes we sequenced was this family of four from Utah, where the two parents were normal. The two kids each had two genetic diseases. And we asked the question, by sequencing those four genomes, could we actually reduce the number of disease gene candidates to a workable uh, set? Uh, and the answer was, uh, uh, strikingly, that we could. But we could do much more. Because you can use the principles of Mendelian genetics in interesting ways, we could eliminate 70% of the DNA sequencing errors. Rare variants are extremely important as disease gene candidates. But a rare variant, if you do just random individuals, you never know whether it's a sequencing error or it's really a rare variant. In families, if two or more members of the family had the rare variant, you knew it wasn't a sequencing error. And we can determine beautifully the haplotypes of chromosomes, that is, the order in which the variants on particular chromosomes for the kids are organized with respect to how their parents' chromosomes are organized. And without going into technical details, this is important because it reduces enormously the chromosomal dimensionality within which disease genes might, might hide. We were actually able to find the mutation rates in the children. They each, on average, had 35 mutation, mutations that differentiated from both parents. So the interesting implication of that is there is no such thing as identical genes. And in this case, we were able to go from hundreds of disease gene candidates initially down to just four. And it was very simple to determine among the four which two of those were, could be assigned to each of the two different genetic diseases that the children have. Now, my prediction in the future is within 10 years, your genome is going to be a critical part of your medical record. I would argue that's true, one, because we'll do the sequences again in families so we can identify disease genes and wellness genes. And two, we'll do it because you'd like to know whether you have any one of the more than 300 actionable variant genes that we've identified. So an example of that, a friend of mine from Microsoft started to get osteoporosis in his late 30s and had an analysis done. And it turned out that he had a defect in a calcium transporter. And he was able to reverse that defect by taking 20 times the normal amount of calcium. So this means if we know you have that defect, we can tell you exactly how to avoid the really severe consequences of uh, early onset uh, osteoporosis. And there are 299 other examples. So when you get those done, we'll search through those 300 examples. If you have one, we'll tell you how you can improve your health. But what's interesting is each year, we identify new actionable variants. So once your genome is done, you'll search every year against the new actionable variants to see if there is still something you can do to further improve your health. So in a sense, your genome will be an investment for the rest of your life in optimizing your health. And of course, the final point is with the new third generation sequencing using nanotechnology and nanopores. My prediction is in five to eight years, we'll have genomes that will cost less than $500. And the typical price today is about 
10 times that much. And of course, that reduces it to the cost of a typical medical uh, test and so forth. Now, a second area that's really important is this area of blood diagnostics. And how exactly are we going to make blood into a window for health and disease? And the reason we want to do so is blood bathes all of your organs, and all of your organs secrete proteins in the blood. And those proteins provide information about the health as opposed to disease nature of your organ. A subset of proteins from each organ that goes into the blood are called organ-specific proteins because they're only synthesized in that organ. And these are particularly powerful diagnostic tools because they have molecular addresses that tell you where they're from, and hence changes in those reflect back directly to the brain if it's a brain-specific protein. We want to be able to do longitudinal analyses. I'm going to talk about that in wellness assays. We want to have multiple parameter assays because we want different biomarkers to assay different networks in the organ to see if and when they become disease perturbed. And of course, we want the assays to be uh, quantitative. Now, the really important thing is Virtually all of the diagnostic studies that have been done for the last uh, 10 years or so have led to results that turned out to be noise. And the reason for that is they've all been of the general form. We'll look at changes in uh, comparing blood from normals and blood from disease. And lo and behold, not surprisingly, you find enormous amounts of changes. All of those changes virtually or noise. And the question is how you can extract from that noise very small amounts to signal. And uh, again, the systems approach in a variety of ways have let us begin to do that. For example, one of the things we have now, we can identify in the blood almost 200 proteins that are brain specific. And those proteins map back into major different functions in the brain very nicely. So, if you see in your blood changes in some of those brain-specific proteins, you not only can say there is a disease occurring, you can guess as to what the disease is because you can begin to infer which of the biological networks have actually become disease perturbed. So let me give you two examples of where we've used systems approaches to blood diagnostics. And one is diagnosing lung cancer. This has been done with a company called Integrated Diagnostics that we started about four years ago. And it really was a magnificent study that essentially uh, utilized an enormous number of systems approaches. And the basic question was really a simple one. We have 3 million x-rays a year of patients in which you see a nodule. And in each case, the physician has to say, is it cancerous or is it normal? So what we set out to do was to create a diagnostic which could identify, on the one hand, the neoplastic nodules or, as a rule-out test, the benign nodules. And it turned out ruling out the benign nodules, identifying the benign nodules, was really important because about 30% of these cases went to surgery, average $50,000 apiece. And of those that went to surgery, more than half of them were benign. So that cost the healthcare system an unnecessary uh, amount of uh, information. So we did create a 13 uh, protein blood biomarker panel that had the ability to at the 90% level, be able to distinguish neoplastic nodules. But even more strikingly, as a rule-out test, at almost the 50% level, could call things as benign nodules. And that's important, because that 50% of the patients, then, could be excluded from these surgical procedures. And that actually uh, led to uh, savings that could be up to five or more billion dollars a year uh, for the healthcare system. It's very attractive to the payers. And this test actually is going to be commercialized probably in June by this company. Uh, uh, and we'll have an opportunity to see 
just how powerful systems diagnostics is going to be. Now, the final thing I'll tell you about in terms of diagnostics is uh, creating a diagnostic for post-traumatic stress syndrome. And the reason this is important is because there are whole classes of neuro neuropsychological diseases for which there are only uh, uh, verbal uh, queries as to the type of diagnosis, and they can be enormously in error. So post-traumatic stress syndrome, 1% of our population has it in severe form, twice as common in women as in men. But for me, the statistic that was most telling is of the 2 million or so soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, somewhere between 5 and 25% had it. And the variance came about as a consequence of different diagnostic procedures for calling the disease. So we were really interested in getting a quantitative measure. And again, we were able to do this, I think, very effectively. We have a, an assay now. It's in the discovery phase. We haven't done the final validation phase. We did do that for the lung cancer test. We're in the midst of doing it now. But in the validation phase, we can make a 95% accurate call. The Department of Defense is enormously excited about this. What we're beginning to do is take exactly the same approach to traumatic brain injury that a lot of the uh, incendiary devices send soldiers back with TBI. And of course, professional athletes have uh, made a lot of uh, noise with regard to TBI. And we're also very in interested in using these approaches uh, to take on much more common uh, neuropsychiatric diseases, schizophrenia, bipolar disease, uh, and, uh, and autism and like. And I think what is really exciting about these diagnostic assays is they'll be able to do four things. One, early diagnosis. Two, we'll be able to follow the progression of the disease. Three, we'll be able to follow the response to therapy. And four, this is really key, will be able to stratify the disease into their distinct subtypes. So again, you can make proper impedance match against uh, putative uh, therapeutic uh, reagents and the like. So let me just say a word or two about wellness assays. These are assays looking to the future. We're just getting ready to start carrying out some of these. But the first is a collaboration that we've had ongoing with Jim Heath here at Caltech for many years now. And Jim has really pioneered the use of microfluidic chips, creating a chip now that can assay 50 different blood proteins readily from a fraction of a droplet of blood in about five minutes. And what we hope to be able to do within the next 10 years is to be able to measure 2,500 blood proteins and what we'd like to do is to measure 50 proteins from each of your 50 major organ systems and follow them longitudinally so we could see any transitions from wellness into disease at a very early stage. And what we need to be able to do that is to create much better ELISA assays for these microfluidic chips. And Jim, again, together with Integrated Diagnostics, is working on some really pioneering advances that will let us think about how to do that uh, in the future. A second area that is absolutely fascinating is the human microbiome. You have on your surfaces and in your gut an enormous number of microbes, and they really affect, in major ways, your, your health. In fact, most of the cells and most of the genes in your body aren't yours. They are the microbes. I mean, it's really striking that 36% of the small molecules in your blood come from microbes in your gut microbiome, and they enormously influence your health, influencing your susceptibility to heart disease, your susceptibility to uh, type 2 diabetes, and on and on. So one of the things we're really interested in doing is developing new assays that can give us uh, instantaneous assessment of the microbiome uh, in these various surfaces. And that's going to be, these will be absolutely transformational studies. And the final wellness assay I'll talk about is the quantized self. 
quantified self. This is, these are social networks that grew out uh, of uh, Wired Magazine, who made the proposal in 2008, that groups of people that wanted to optimize their wellness should get together in networks and crowdsource and figure out how to do things better. And of course, since that time, a lot has changed. One, uh, we now have 70 devices that, out there that can measure digital information in you, how well you sleep, uh, how much you exercise, blood pressure, on and on and on. And we have 10,000 apps that are related to wellness in one way or another. So there are powerful opportunities for crowdsourcing, and indeed, the quantified self-networks are in all the major cities uh, in the US, and they're growing very, very rapidly. And what's important about these social networks is they're beginning to have a big impact on medicine. A good friend of mine at uh, San Diego, Larry Smarr, was one of the early practitioners of the quantized self movement. He used the digital devices, but even more, he used classic medical assays. And what you can see in the lower graph there are a series of spikes where he has inflammatory reactions where five physicians in a row blew him off until finally he ended up in the hospital with uh, an acute episode of inflammatory bowel disease. And the quantified self people are going to physicians and beginning to force them into the uh, 21st century. And indeed, this leads us now to P4 medicine, which is the convergence of three major forces. One is big data. Uh, the second are these patient-activated social networks. And the third is the idea of systems medicine. And we'll talk about the four Ps in just a moment. What I do want to say is my own view of the way we're going to get systems medicine and P4 medicine accepted by the healthcare system is through patient-activated social networks. I think physicians are way too conservative and will take too long to uh, embrace these new changes. But I think patient-activated social networks are really going to be transformational. So the first P is predictive. And you, you've really heard the mantra of how we can think about these in a five to 10 year stage. You'll have your genomes done from those genomes we'll be able to infer an enormous amount of information about one, optimizing wellness, and two, minimizing disease. And number two, I think by that time, we'll have the ability to measure from the blood these uh, 2,500 organ-specific blood proteins so we can follow all of your systems real time and get very early warning on disease. The idea of prevention is one, we're going to have completely new approaches to identifying drug targets. I think that is going to revolutionize the cost of uh, creating drugs in the future. Uh, and two, I think by taking a systems approach to the immune system, for the first time, we'll be able to create uh, effective cellular immune vaccines that could deal with uh, TB and, and uh, AIDS and some of the classic scourges of the third world that uh, Bill Gates has spent so much money in attempting to attack. The personalized side of medicine arises from the fact that, on average, each of you differs by six million letters of the DNA language from the person sitting next to you. So each of you uniquely has to act as a control for your own uh, virtual cloud of data. And that's going to be a critical part of medicine in the future. The participatory relates to the social aspects of medicine. One, how are we going to create these uh, uh, patient-activated social networks to drive the process? Or two, and this is really a critical one, how are we going to convince society that each of us must make available our data clouds for mining for the predictive medicine of the future so we can transform the nature of healthcare for your children and for your grandchildren. There are enormous constraints on the freedom to use this kind of information. And I'll tell you, when I go to China and see no such constraints, I'm terribly worried that China is going to be the place where P4 medicine uh, could first emerge. 
There's also the question of how do we educate patients, physicians, and the healthcare system to what P4 medicine is? Or how do we create an IT system for healthcare that can handle the kind of information dimensionality that we've talked about here? And again, I don't see many, uh, I don't see many IT companies that are thinking in a very deep way about this. So really, P4 medicine is about just two things. One, how can we quantify wellness? And two, how can we uh, demystify disease? And I would argue that P4 medicine has five fundamental social implications. And this is what I'll close with. One, um, I think it's going to turn around the sharply escalating costs of health care. And I think it will do so in such an effective manner that we'll be able to export it to the developing world. And this can lead to a democratization of healthcare inconceivable to think about even four or five years ago. Uh, number two, it's going to lead to a digitalization of medicine. We've already seen these 70 devices that are beginning to digitalize our measurement, and that's the way all medicine will go. And that's critical to driving down costs because the digitalization of communications and IT has enormously driven down the costs of those ventures, just as this will drive down the cost of generating your virtual uh, billion dollar uh, data clouds surrounding each different patient. Number three, I think over the next 10 years, every single sector of the healthcare industry is going to have to refashion in a major way its business plan to take into account the dictates of P4 medicine. I think many aren't going to be able to do this, and I think they will become dinosaurs and extinct. And of course, what this does is opens up the opportunity for agile young companies that are built around the opportunities of P4 medicine to, uh, to move into these uh, ecological economic niches and so forth. I think a final point is I think P4 medicine is going to generate enormous wealth for the individuals, uh, institutions, nations that really practice it. And an example I can give you of this is that my own feeling is in a 10 to 15 year future, the wellness industry will far exceed in value the healthcare industry. And the wellness industry is just getting started now. So it's a wonderful opportunity uh, to build the wellness giants of the future. And I must say, ISB is thinking very hard about how to do that exactly. And then the final point is what I opened with. I think P4 medicine, systems medicine, have already begun to transform healthcare. We are seeing places where healthcare is improved. We're seeing uh, how the costs can be reduced. And we're seeing how thinking about this in the right way opens up enormous economic opportunities. It is a very exciting future and one with enormous potential for young students that would like to see, seek something really exciting for the future. Thanks very much. Do you want questions or questions? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you very much, Lee, for that deep and inspiring talk. I'll be processing on that for quite some time, but it really is. That was exciting. So this is uh, Dr. Chameau's last big alumni event at Caltech. We very much appreciate his leadership, his vision, his partnership, and his enthusiasm. We know Caltech is a better place because he and Carol were here. Dr. Chameau, would you please join me on stage so I can present you with a goodbye gift from the Caltech Alumni Association. So I've got a little more material here. Uh, no, please. Uh, so jean louis you've consistently articulated Caltech's strengths and accomplishments in a compelling way. Uh, while most of us uh, alums may be known for analytical ability and science training, I and some others are not always known for charm and sophistication. <laughs> but with you and Carol representing us, we know that we can go one-on-one -on -one with any other university in those areas too. Finally, 
you made it clear to us that alums and students, our future alums, were really important to the Institute. For all this, we really thank you very much. We hear you like to cook, so you hope you will remember, you'll remember us uh, when you use this. It's a cutting board. On this cutting board is a DNA helix, and you and Carol will always be part of Caltech's DNA. Uh, 